very essence of civil liberties certainly consists in the right of every individual to claim the protection of the laws whenever he receives an injury. One of the first duties of government is to afford that protection. The government of the United States has been emphatically termed a government of laws and not of men. Howdy everybody and welcome. You are watching the Defenders of Rights. We are bringing you another educational and important episode of Learning the Law. Today we're going to be discussing in much detail about Chapter 8, which is the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution for the United States of America, and the Indiana Republic Constitution of 1816 and 1851. Of course, all of this information is deriving from the document titled The Constitutionally Protected and Secured Right to Locomotion and Personal Liberty, the Right to Travel, and a Private Conveyance slash Private Automobile. What we're going to be discussing is everything that every single public official is bound to uphold. So you are going to want to definitely stay tuned because what you're about to learn is everything about the law. Now we definitely want to say thank you to all the viewers out there. A majority of the comments that we have been receiving have been wonderful, been amazing. We've gotten a lot of feedback and we have received a lot of support. And we could do nothing but appreciate that. Of course, we guarantee there's going to be plenty more content coming. Definitely check it out. Hit the like button. If you haven't already yet, please subscribe. For all those who have subscribed, a big thanks goes out to you. Your support is all we can ask for. And we thank you for that support. And we definitely want to give a big thanks to the Lord Jesus Christ, God Almighty. If it wasn't for Him, we wouldn't be doing this. We are thankful for all of His blessings. We thank Him for giving us the strength, the courage, and the wisdom to do what's right and to fight for what's right. He's kept us focused and kept us strong. And we will continue to dedicate our lives till things are better for we the people. Let's just dive into this, shall we? The first thing we come across is the Declaration of Independence. And here it is, the beginning, word for word. When, in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments were instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it, and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence, indeed, will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty, to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. That was the most important of this document. And how important it is. It, that has been incorporated to every constitution of all the 50 states of the Union. Here in the Indiana Republic, that is first and foremost. That is Article 1, Section 1. It has also been incorporated into the preamble of the Indiana Republic Constitution of 1851. You want to see? Well, that's what's next. The preamble of the Indiana Republic Constitution of 1816. We, the representatives of the people of the Territory of Indiana, in convention met at Corridon on Monday, the 10th day of June in the year of our Lord, 1816, and of the independence of the United States, the 40th having the right of admission into the general government as a member of the Union, consistent with the Constitution for the United States, the Ordinance of Congress of 1787, and the Law of Congress, entitled, An Act to Enable the People of the Indiana Territory to Form a Constitution and State Government, and for the admission of such state into the Union on an equal footing with the original states. In order to establish justice, promote the welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, 
do ordain and establish the following constitution or form of government, and do mutually agree with each other to form ourselves into a free and independent state by the name of the state of Indiana. Next, we have the preamble of the Indiana Republic Constitution of 1851. To the end, that justice be established, public order maintained, and liberty perpetuated. We the people of the state of Indiana, grateful to Almighty God for the free exercise of the right to choose our own form of government, do ordain this Constitution. Next, we have Article 1, Bill of Rights, Section 1 of the Indiana Republic Constitution of 1816. That the general, great, and essential principles of liberty and free government may be recognized and alterably established. We declare that all men are born equally free and independent, and have certain natural, inherent, and unalienable rights, among which are the enjoying and defending life and liberty, and of acquiring, possessing, and protecting property, and pursuing and obtaining happiness and safety. And then we provide you Article 1, Bill of Rights, Section 1 of the Indiana Republic Constitution of 1851. It states this, We declare that all people are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that all power is inherent in the people, and that all free governments are and of right ought to be founded on their authority and instituted for their peace, safety, and well-being. For the advancement of these ends, the people have at all times an indefeasible right to alter and reform their government. And as you can see, I have a court case right underneath this. That goes further in detail of what that section means. And as always with case law, I'm going to read to you the underlying parts because that's the most important parts out of that case. Whereas defined pursuant to matter of Lawrence, this is the Supreme Court of the Indiana Republic in 1991. End quote. The law and standing rule in Indiana courts has been that a case is deemed mute when no effective relief can be rendered to the parties before the court, when the concrete controversy at issue in a case has been ended or settled, or in some manner disposed of, so as to render it unnecessary to decide the question involved, the case will be dismissed. While Article 3 of the United States Constitution limits the jurisdiction of federal courts to actual cases and controversies, the Indiana Constitution does not contain any similar restraint. Thus, although mute cases are usually dismissed, Indiana courts have long recognized that a case may be decided on its merits under an exception to the general rule when the case involves questions of great public interest. Cases found to fall within the public interest exception typically contain issues like to recur. Indiana's common law doctrine of informed consent recognizes the right of the patient to intelligently reject or accept treatment. The patient's right of self-determination is the sine qua non of the physician's duty to obtain informed consent. As Justice, then Judge, Cardozo said, Every human being of adult years and sound mind has a right to determine what shall be done with his own body. This common law has evolved in a legal culture governed by the Indiana Constitution, which begins by declaring that the liberty of our citizens is inalienable. The debates of our Constitutional Convention suggest that those who wrote the Constitution believed that liberty included the opportunity to manage one's own life, except in those areas yielded up to the body politic and the body politic they speak of is the state, the State of the Union, in this case the Indiana Republic. Note 3. Delegate Thomas Smith declared that Article 1, Section 1 constituted a recognition that God had given to all persons equally complete sovereignty over their affairs, including the simplest, such as the pursuit of happiness, and the right to walk abroad and look upon the brightness of the sun at noonday. Delegate John B. Ho asserted that when people create governments, they do not create restrictions on their natural rights, but merely delegate a portion of them to government for so long as they deem it expedient. In our society, healthcare decisions making for patients typically transfers upon incom incompetence to the patient's family. Our common human experience informs us that family members are generally most concerned with the welfare of a patient. It is they who provide for the patient's comfort, care, and best interest, and they who treat the patient as a person rather than a symbol of a cause. Even when they have not left formal advance directives or expressed particular opinions about life-sustaining medical treatment, most Americans want the decisions about their care upon their incapacity to be made for them by family and physician rather than by strangers or by government. 
This right to consent to the patient's course of treatment necessarily includes the right to refuse a course of treatment. The history of liberty has largely been the history of observance of procedural safeguards. Recognition of the basic natural rights of each person to life and liberty is the starting point for courts in dealing with cases of this class. Article 1, Section 1, Indiana Constitution. Protection for life and liberty is guaranteed by the Constitution. Article 1, Sections 1 and 12, Indiana Constitution. Courts must be vigilant in cases coming before them to protect these basic natural rights. The common law recognizes the right of the individual to refuse medical treatment in appropriate circumstances. Well said by this court, obviously discussing Article 1, Section 1 of what we just read prior to this case. Now as I'm reading these, you'll notice that the Constitution of 1816 and the Constitution of 1851 of the Indiana Republic sound very much alike. And they are very much alike, there's just a few differences. And obviously, most of the language incorporated into those constitutions derive from the Constitution for the United States of America as well as the Declaration of Independence. And there are a few sections in this episode that I will go over, that I will explain in detail, I will interpret for you in layman's terms, because some of it is difficult to understand. Next is Article 1, Bill of Rights, Section 2 of the Indiana Republic Constitution of 1816. That all power is inherent in the people and all free governments are founded on their authority and instituted for their peace, safety, and happiness. For the advancement of these ends, they have at all times an unalienable and indefeasible right to alter and reform their government in such a manner as they may think proper. Next is Article 1, Bill of Rights, Section 2 of the Indiana Republic Constitution of 1851. All people shall be secured in the natural right to worship Almighty God, according to the dictates of their own consciences. Now, obviously, that summed up Section 1 and 2 of the current Constitution of 1851, but also added a few more things that I think are very pertinent to our freedom, to our liberties, such as the part that says no human authority can in any case whatever control or interfere with the rights of conscience. I feel as though those words should have been incorporated into the current Constitution of the Indiana Republic, the 1851 Constitution. Next, we have Article 1, Bill of Rights, Section 3 of the Indiana Republic Constitution of 1851. No law shall, in any case whatever, control the free exercise and enjoyment of religious opinions or interfere with the rights of conscience. That is self-explanatory. Next, we have Article 1, Bill of Rights, Section 4 of the Indiana Republic Constitution of 1851. No preference shall be given by law to any creed, religious society, or mode of worship, and no person shall be compelled to attend, erect, or support any place of worship or to maintain any ministry against his consent. Next, Article 1, Section 10, Clause 1 of the Constitution for the United States of America. No state shall enter into any treaty, alliance, or confederation, grant letters of marque and reprisal, coin money, emit bills of credit, make anything but gold and silver coin a tender in payment of debts, pass any bill of attainder, ex post facto law, or law impairing the obligation of contracts, or grant any title of nobility. So obviously, Section 10, Clause 1 of the Constitution for the United States of America covers quite a bit, and so I got plenty of bulletin points to go over. Now, it says, shall not pass any bill of attainder. Okay, so let's see what a bill of attainder is. According to Black's Law Dictionary, 6th edition, page 165, Bill of Attainder means legislative acts, no matter what their form, that apply either to named individuals or to easily ascertainable members of a group in such a way as to inflict punishment on them without a judicial trial. An act is a bill of attainder when the punishment is death, and a bill of pains and penalties when the punishment is less severe. Both kinds of punishment fall within the scope of the constitutional prohibition. Okay. 
A bill of attainder or a bill of pains and penalties are a legislative or administrative predetermination of guilt without judicial review, which is guilty until proven innocent. The state of Indiana, amongst the other states, have implanted surcharges to particular types of offenses. In addition, there is no requirement before the surcharges can be levied against a constitutional private citizen of the Indiana Republic, American citizen, or state national, that he or she actually be convicted of the offense they're being accused of. And of course, as everybody can notice, that our judiciary has determined everybody to be guilty. Well, due process requires innocence before guilty. We are innocent until proven guilty, not guilty until proven innocent. Things have changed dramatically. And of course, you heard me say surcharges. A surcharge, according to Black's Law Dictionary, 6th edition, page 1441, a surcharge is defined as an overcharge, an exaction, impost, or encumbrance beyond what is just and right, or beyond one's authority or power. Term may also refer to a second or further mortgage, the amount with which a court may charge a fiduciary who has breached his trust through intentional or negligent conduct, the imposition of personal liability on a fiduciary for such conduct. It also means the imposition of personal liability on a fiduciary for willful or neg negligent misconduct in the administration of his fiduciary duties. In equity practice, to show that a particular item in favor of the party surcharging ought to have been included but was not in an account which is alleged to be settled or complete. To prove the omission of an item from an account which is before the court as complete which should be inserted to the credit of the party surcharging. And of course, every crime is considered commercial in nature, according to the Code of Federal Regulations. We'll talk about that later. So now every crime nowadays, whether it be misdemeanor or a felony, they're surcharging us out the ass. The poorest people gotta pay the most, and the richest don't even gotta pay a dime. There's so much injustice going around, it's unbelievable. But the way the system is set up is for us to fail. Everything is meant to be a crime. Everybody commits what? 20 crimes per day, not even knowing it. It's all injustice. And they're charging us out the wazoo, and that's what a surcharge means. Next in bulletin is the Indiana Code, Title IX Motor Vehicles, Section 9-24-13-6. Validity of licenses and permits. Burden of proof. Production of evidence. The burden is on the defendant to prove by a preponderance of the evidence that the defendant had been issued a driver's license or permit that was valid at the time of the alleged violation. You'll see where I'm going with this. Next, Indiana Code Title IX Motor Vehicles, Section 9-24-13-3, Possession and Display of Licenses and Permits. An individual holding a permit or driver's license issued under this article must have the permit or driver's license in the individual's immediate possession when driving or operating a motor vehicle. The individual shall display the driver's license or permit upon demand of a court or a police officer authorized by law to enforce motor vehicle rules. The statute Indiana Code section 9-24-13-6 violates due process by reversing the burden of proof, presumes guilt over innocence, and acts as a bill of pains and penalties. Simply put, Indiana Code section 9-24-13-6 as well as Indiana Code section 9-24-13-3 is identifying that the courts have already enforced motor vehicle rules and determined that the alleged offender is guilty without a tribunal or judicial review until the alleged offenders proves by preponderance of the evidence that he or she did indeed have a driver's license or permit to drive or operate a motor vehicle upon the highways. The courts and police officers won't even acknowledge a private citizen's vested, unalienable slash inalienable and constitutionally protected and secured right to locomotion and personal liberty, their right to travel freely upon the highways in a private conveyance slash private automobile that is not using the streets and highways for incidental purposes for profit or gain. The police officers are acting as highwaymen, by definition. According to Black's Law Dictionary, 6th edition, page 729, highwayman is defined as a bandit, one who robs travelers upon the highway. See also hijacking. This is, by definition and application, a bill of pains and penalties, and this also violates more than multiple constitutional provisions. Remember, end quote, it is therefore the adaptation and use rather than the form or kind of conveyance that concerns the courts. That was said by Indiana Springs Company versus Brown, the Supreme Court of the Indiana Republic in 1905. 
Next bulletin covers the bills of credit and how no state of the union is allowed to emit bills of credit. When of course that's all we deal with are Federal Reserve notes. Federal Reserve notes? What are those? For those of you who don't know what Federal Reserve notes are, you're about to find out. For those of you who do, here's some more information for you. According to Black's Law Dictionary, 6th edition, page 164, bill of credit is defined as a bill or promissory note issued by the government upon its faith and credit designed to circulate in the community as money. See Federal Reserve Notes, Treasury Bill. In mercantile law, a license or authority given in writing from one person to another, very common among merchants, bankers, and those who travel, empowering a person to receive or take up money of their correspondence abroad. See also letters of credit. So a bill of credit is a bill or promissory note, which is a Federal Reserve note, which is the $10 bill you have in your wallet, or the $1 or the $20 or the $100 bill that you have in your wallet. Those are Federal Reserve notes. Those are promises to pay. They're not real money by definition. By legal definition, those are not considered money. And I'll show you. Black's Law Dictionary, 6th edition, provides a multitude of definitions that inform the private citizens of what isn't common knowledge. Here we go. In Black's Law Dictionary, 6th edition, page 483, dollars defined as the money unit employed in the United States of the value of 100 cents or of any combination of coins totaling 100 cents. According to Black's Law Dictionary, 6th edition, page 224, cent is defined as a coin of the United States, the least in value of those now minted. It is the hundredth part of a dollar. According to Black's Law Dictionary, 6th edition, page 1005, money is defined as in usual and ordinary acceptation, it means coins and paper currency used as circulating medium of exchange and does not embrace notes, bonds, evidences of debt, or other personal or real estate. So according to the legal definition of buddy, Federal Reserve Notes aren't included. In Black's Law Dictionary, 6th edition, page 382, currency is defined as coined money in such bank notes or other paper money as are authorized by law and do in fact circulate from hand to hand as the medium of exchange. In Black's Law Dictionary, 6th edition, page 383, current money is defined as the currency of the country, whatever is intended to and does actually circulate as currency every species of coin or currency. It is employed to describe money which passes from hand to hand, person to person, and circulates through the community, and is generally received. Money is current which is received as money in the common business transactions and is the common medium in barter and trade. In Black's Law Dictionary, 6th edition, page 897, legal tender is defined as all coins and currencies of the United States, including Federal Reserve notes and circulating notes of Federal Reserve banks and national banking associations, regardless of when coined or issued, are legal tender for all debts, public and private, public charges, taxes, duties, and dues. According to Black's Law Dictionary, 6th edition, page 623, fiat money is defined as paper currency not backed by gold or silver. According to Black's Law Dictionary, 6th edition, page 639, flat money is defined as paper money which is not backed by gold or silver but issued by order of the government. According to Black's Law Dictionary, 6th edition, page 613, Federal Reserve Notes is defined as form of currency issued by Federal Reserve Banks and the likeliness of non-interest bearing promissory note payable to bear on demand. The Federal Reserve Note example 1, 5, 10, etc. dollar bill, is the most widely used paper currency. Such have replaced silver and gold certificates which were backed by silver and gold. Such reserve notes are direct obligations of the United States. So in essence, a Federal Reserve note is synonymous with a promissory note, a promise to pay something that's owed and not backed by gold or silver. According to Black's Law Dictionary, 6th edition, page 1487, Token money is defined as a conventional medium of exchange consisting of pieces of metal fashioned in the shape and size of coins and circulating among private persons by consent at a certain value, no longer permitted or recognized as money. Notice that today's so-called coins are in the shape and size of coins but are not coins themselves, and they have a certain value but not a fixed value. Let's compare this to what a coin actually is from the same law dictionary. 
According to Black's Law Dictionary, 6th edition, page 260, coin is defined as pieces of gold, silver, or other metal fashioned into a prescribed shape, weight, and degree of fineness, and stamped by authority of the government with certain marks and devices, and put into circulation as money at a fixed value. Real coins include pieces of gold or silver or other precious metals which have a fineness to it and are at a fixed value. Even a copper penny has a fixed value because a hundred copper pennies could be exchanged for a one dollar piece of gold or silver. The next bulletin is defining promissory note from the Indiana Code. Indiana Code Title 26, Commercial Law, Section 26-1-9.1-102, Definitions and Index of Definitions. Number 65. Promissory note means an instrument that evidences a promise to pay a monetary obligation, does not evidence an order to pay, and does not contain an acknowledgement by a bank that the bank has received for deposit a sum of money or funds. Next is Hamilton v. State. This is the Supreme Court of the Indiana Republic in 1877. End quote. Lawful money of the United States might consist of gold or silver coin, or United States Treasury notes and the fractional currency. The notes of the national banks furnish a large portion of the circulating medium. The notes of the national banks are in no sense money of the United States. Interesting. Next court case is Christensen v. Beebe. This is the Supreme Court of the Utah Republic in 1907. End quote. Of course, it might be contended that a promissory note, even if secured, is only the evidence of the promise. A promise to pay cannot, by argument, however ingenious, be made the equivalent of actual payment. End quote. Dang, that's speaking and saying a lot right there. Next court case is State v. Downs. This is the Supreme Court of the Indiana Republic in 1897. End quote. Money in its strict technical sense, is coined metal, usually gold or silver, upon which the government stamp has been imposed to indicate its value. Next comes from 36 American Jurisprudence, Money, Sections 8 and 9, pages 462 to 463. Section 8, Currency, Specie, Current Funds, and Dollar. The term dollar means money, since it is the unit of money in this country, and in the absence of qualifying words, it cannot mean promissory notes or bonds or other evidences of debt. Beautifully said. Section 9. Bank Notes They are a good tender as money unless specifically objected to. They are not, like bills of exchange, considered as mere securities or documents of debts, and generally, they are classed as money even in criminal proceedings, where, as a rule, the greatest strictness of construction prevails. However, notwithstanding the general prevailing rule that banknotes are money, there is considerable authority, especially among the earlier cases, which maintains the rule that banknotes are not to be classed as money. Even under the majority rule, all banknotes are not necessarily money. They circulate as such only by the general consent and usage of the community. This consent and usage is based upon the convertibility of such notes into coin, at the pleasure of the holder, upon their presentation to the bank for redemption. This fact is the vital principle which sustains their character as money. As long as they are, in fact, what they purport to be, payable on demand, common consent gives them the ordinary attributes of money. But upon the failure of the bank by which they were issued, when its doors are closed, and its inability to redeem its bills is openly avowed, they instantly lose the character of money. Their circulation as currency ceases with the usage and consent upon which it rested, and the notes become the mere dishonored and depreciated evidence of debt. And this is all just further validating that Federal Reserve notes aren't money. Next bulletin, we have Title 31, Money and Finance, Treasury, the Code of Federal Regulations, Section 103.11. A promissory note is also defined as U. Monetary Instruments. 1. Monetary instruments include currency, traveler's checks in any form, all negotiable instruments including personal checks, business checks, official bank's checks, cashier's checks, third-party checks, Promissory notes, as that term is defined in the Uniform Commercial Code, and money orders that are either in bare form, endorsed without restriction, made out to a fictitious payee for the purposes of Section 103.23, or otherwise in such form that title thereto passes upon delivery. 
Next bulletin. Whereas defined pursuant to the Uniform Commercial Code, Section 3-104, Negotiable Instruments, and the Indiana Code, Title 26, Commercial Law, Section 26-1-3.1-104, Negotiable Instruments. A. Negotiable instrument means an unconditional promise or order to pay a fixed amount of money with or without interest or other charges described in the promise or order. Going down to B. Instrument means a negotiable instrument. Going down to E. An instrument is a note if it is a promise and is a draft if it is an order. So it even has all these definitions incorporated into the Indiana Code. Why? Because the Uniform Commercial Code has been implemented by every state of the Union. And this is all commercial law. Money is strictly dealt with by commercial law. It is governed by commercial law. Next we have Don E. Williams Company versus Commissioner. This is the United States Supreme Court in 1977. End quote. The promissory note, even when payable on demand and fully secured, is still, as its name implies, only a promise to pay. The next court case is a very controversial court case. It is not one well known. Why? Because this is one of the many cases that have been covered up. The public has been prevented from seeing it. Of course, that doesn't mean that you cannot see it. And of course, the defenders of rights have found it. You'll see the source of this case. The website has popped up on the screen. Like I said, a very controversial court case, one that's been hidden from the public. It is First National Bank of Montgomery versus Jerome Daly. This was back in 1968, determined by Justice of the Peace of Credit River Township in Scott County. That is found in the Minnesota Republic, and the justice was named Martin V. Mahoney. After this case was determined, according to accountable sources, this Justice of the Peace was murdered six months later. It was determined to be a homicide, but six months later, he was murdered. We all know the story and how this occurs. Of course, this happened to JFK, the assassination of him. Chris Cornell and Chester from Lincoln Park, all considered suicides, but we all know they were murdered. Why? Because they are fighting the evil in this world, and my heart goes out to them and their families. But what Justice Mahoney said in this court case is amazing, and of course, I'm only going to read you what is underlined. End quote. The division and separation of the three great powers of government, the executive, the legislative, and the judicial, and the principle that these powers should be forever kept separate and distinct as of vital importance to the maintenance and establishment of a free government, without which this republic cannot possibly survive. Under a form of government, every American, individually or by representation, is the high and supreme sovereign authority. The authority at each of the three departments of government is defined and established. It is entirely fitting and proper to observe that in all instances between the states and the United States and the people, there is no such thing as the idea of a compact between the people on one side and the government on the other. The compact is that of the people with each other to produce and constitute a government. To suppose that any government can be a party to a compact with the whole people is supposing it to have an existence before it can have a right to exist. The only instance in which a compact can take place between the people and those who exercise the government is that the people shall pay them while they choose to employ them. A constitution is the property of the nation, and more specifically of the individual, and not those who exercise the government. All the constitutions of America are declared to be established in the authority of the people. The authority of the Constitution is grounded upon the absolute, God-given free agency of each individual, and this is the basis of all powers granted, reserved or withheld in the authorization of every word, phrase, clause, or paragraph of the Constitution. Any attempt by Congress, the President, or the courts to limit, change, or enlarge even the most claimed insignificant provision is therefore ultra-virus and void ab initio. In this state, as well as in all republics, it is not the legislature, however transcendent its powers, who are supreme, but the people, and to suppose that they may violate the fundamental law is, as has been most eloquently expressed, to affirm that the deputy is greater than his principal, that the servant is above his master, that the representatives of the people are superior to the people themselves, that men acting by virtue of delegated power may do not only what their powers do not authorize, but what they forbid. A state can only act through its agents, and it would be absurd to say that any act was not done by a state which was done by its authorized agents. This is contrary to the Constitution of the United States. The states have no power to make banknotes a legal tender. 
Only gold and silver coin is a lawful tender. Banknotes are a good tender on money unless specifically objected to. Their consent and usage is based upon the convertibility of such notes to coin at the pleasure of the holder upon presentation to the bank for redemption. When the inability of a bank to redeem its notes is openly avowed, they instantly lose their character as money and their circulation as currency ceases. There is also no lawful consideration for these notes to circulate as money. The banks actually obtained these notes for the cost of the printing. The Federal Reserve and national banks exercise an exclusive monopoly and privilege of creating credit and issuing their notes at the expense of the public, which does not receive a fair equivalent. This scheme is obliquely designed for the benefit of an idle monopoly to rob, blackmail, and oppress the producers of wealth. The Federal Reserve Act and the National Bank Act is in its operation and effect contrary to the whole letter and spirit of the Constitution of the United States, confers an unlawful and unnecessary power on private parties, holds all of our fellow citizens in dependence, is subversive to the rights and liberties of the people. It has defined the lawful constituted government of the United States. The Federal Reserve and National Banking Acts and Section 462 of Title 31, which is now located in Title 31 United States Code Section 392, are not necessary and proper for carrying into execution the legislative powers granted to Congress or any other powers vested in the government of the United States, but, on the contrary, are subversive to the rights of the people and their rights to life, liberty, and property. There's much more said in this court case. I don't want to take up the whole episode. So I'm going to cut it off there. But you get the concept of the message this justice is trying to convey. It's amazing. It's beautiful. Now, what is all this talk of emitting bills of credit and the due process right of innocent until proven guilty? Why am I talking about this? Because Article 1, Section 10, Clause 1 of the Constitution for the United States of America has stated that no state shall emit bills of credit, make anything but gold and silver coin a tender in payment of debts, and... It shall not pass any bill of attainder, which I'm sure every state of the union is doing so at this very minute. Next, we have Article 1, Bill of Rights, Section 18 of the Indiana Republic Constitution of 1816. No ex post facto law, nor any law impairing the validity of contracts, shall ever be made, and no conviction shall work corruption of blood, nor forfeiture of estate. So what this section of the Indiana Republic Constitution of 1816 is saying is, now, for those of you who do not understand the concept of work corruption of blood, I'll explain it. It means this. No son or daughter can be condemned for their father's sins or their mother's sins, their parents' sins, period. So whatever crime that you may commit in a lifetime, your children will not suffer from. You cannot blame a child for their parents' crimes. Many ways to say this, but I hope you get the gist. Next, we have Article 1, Bill of Rights, Section 24 of the Indiana Republic Constitution of 1851. No ex post facto law or law impairing the obligation of contracts shall ever be passed. And obviously, you're picking up that we've been talking about impairing the obligation of contracts. So, let's do that. According to Black's Law Dictionary, 6th edition, page 752, impairing the obligation of the contracts is defined as a law which impairs the obligation of a contract is one which renders the contract in and itself less valuable or less enforceable, whether by changing its terms and stipulations, its legal qualities and conditions, or by regulating the remedy for its enforcement. To impair the obligation of a contract within prohibition of Article 1, Section 10, the U.S. Constitution, it is to weaken it, lessen its value, or make it worse in any respect or in any degree, and any law which changes the intention and legal effect of the parties, giving to one a greater and to the other a less interest or benefit, or which imposes conditions not included in the contract, or dispenses with the performance of those included, impairs the obligation of the contract. A statute impairs the obligation of a contract when by its terms it nullifies or materially changes existing contract obligations. Next is Article 1, Bill of Rights, Section 30 of the Indiana Republic Constitution of 1851. No conviction shall work corruption of blood or forfeiture of estate. So the current Constitution has the concept of work corruption of blood. Good. Next we have Article 1, Bill of Rights, Section 22 of the Indiana Republic Constitution of 1816. That the legislature shall not grant any title of nobility or hereditary distinctions, nor create any office, the appointment to which shall be for a longer term than good behavior. Now, the title of nobility is a big one. It is one not mentioned on the news today, nor any day for that matter. Title of nobility derived from the very first 13th Amendment 
to the Constitution for the United States of America. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, the 13th Amendment has been changed three times. But that is another conversation for another episode. Article 1, Bill of Rights, Section 35 of the Indiana Republic Constitution of 1851. The General Assembly shall not grant any title of nobility nor confer hereditary distinctions. Next, we have Article 11, Corporations, Section 1 of the Indiana Republic Constitution of 1851. The General Assembly shall not have power to establish or incorporate any bank or banking company or moneyed institution for the purpose of issuing bills of credit or bills payable to order or bear except under the conditions prescribed in this Constitution. And of course, the next few sections deals with the same concept from Article 11, Corporations of the Indiana Republic Constitution of 1851. This is where the state cannot emit bills of credit and must have gold and silver as a tender and payment. Like Article 11, Corporations, Section 7 of the Indiana Republic Constitution of 1851, it states this, All bills or notes issued as money shall be, at all times, redeemable in gold or silver. And no law shall be passed, sanctioning, directly or indirectly, the suspension by any bank or banking company of specie payments. Does anybody receive gold or silver coin when they turn their Federal Reserve notes in or when they go to cash their check or deposit their check for that matter? Yeah, there's no more gold and silver. The state is currently committing a crime, a constitutional violation. We're going to jump down to Article 2, Distribution of the Powers of Government, Section 1 of the Indiana Republic Constitution of 1816. The powers of the government of Indiana shall be divided into three distinct departments, and each of them be confided to a separate body of magistracy, to wit, those which are legislative to one, those which are executive to another, and those which are judiciary to another. And no person or collection of persons being of one of those departments shall exercise any power properly attached to either of the others, except in the instances herein expressly permitted. Next we have Article 3, Distribution of Powers, Section 1 of the Indiana Republic Constitution of 1851. The powers of the government are divided into three separate departments, the legislative, the executive, including the administrative, and the judicial. And no person charged with official duties under one of these departments shall exercise any of the functions of another, except as in this Constitution expressly provided. Now what these sections are saying is that there are three departments, the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary. And they are all must be kept separate. And of course the administrative, which is tied to the executive branch. The administrative branch consists of police officers, DCS case workers, B and V employees, etc. Next, we have Article 3, Legislative, Section 15 of the Indiana Republic Constitution of 1816. The doors of each house and of committees of the whole shall be kept open, except in such cases as, in the opinion of the house, may require secrecy. Neither house shall, without the consent of the other, adjourn for more than two days, nor to any other place than that in which the two houses shall be sitting. We're going to come back to that because this is also stated in the Indiana Republic Constitution of 1851. Next, we have Article 4, Legislative, Section 1 of the Indiana Republic Constitution of 1851. The legislative authority of the state shall be vested in a General Assembly, which shall consist of a Senate and a House of Representatives. The style of every law shall be being enacted by the General Assembly of the State of Indiana, and no law shall be enacted except by bill. This one is very important because this one is what determines what is actually law created by the legislature. So anytime you see a law written by the General Assembly, it will say this, be it enacted by the General Assembly of the State of Indiana. Now I do not see that anywhere in the Indiana Code or the Indiana Administrative Code. I just see a bunch of statutes. And that's because those codes and statutes all derive from the bills issued by the legislature. And we're going to talk about that here in a little bit as well. Next, Article 4, Legislative, Section 13 of the Indiana Republic Constitution of 1851. The doors of each house and of committees of the whole shall be kept open, except in such cases as, as in the opinion of either house, may require secrecy. There's that word again, secrecy. Let's discuss this for a moment. According to Black's Law Dictionary, 6th edition, page 1351, secrecy is defined as the quality or condition of being concealed or secret, as the proceedings of a grand jury are to be held in secrecy. 
So, of course, these guys, the legislature, want to meet in secrecy if it may require. They're keeping secrets. And this is supposed to be a completely 100% transparency. Our current president of the United States, Donald Trump, is consistently talking about how transparent he is. And he very much is. The public knows what he's doing at all times. Respect him very much for that and for many other reasons. He's been by far the best, one of the best presidents of our history. But we're not going to get into politics here. I just wanted to point out that this is forbidden. This secrecy concept. Totally disagree. For elected or appointed public officials to have secrecy is to go against the established Republican form of government. There must be complete transparency from the governments of the constitutional United States of America. And this includes all 50 sovereign states of the Union. Next, Article 4, Legislative, Section 18 of the Indiana Republic Constitution of 1851. Every bill shall be read by title on three several days. In each house, unless in the case of emergency, two-thirds of the house where such bill may be pending shall, by vote of yeas and nays, deem it expedient to dispense with this rule. But the reading of a bill by title on its final passage shall in no case be dispensed with, and the vote on the passage of every bill or joint resolution shall be taken by yeas and nays. And this is the process that our public officials in the legislature must go through. They must abide by it. They are bound by it. Does it occur? Does it happen? Do they follow this constitutional provision? Let's hope so. Article 4, Legislative, Section 19 of the Indiana Republic Constitution of 1851. An act, except an act for the codification, revision, or rearrangement of laws, shall be confined to one subject and matters properly connected therewith. Now that is also very important. Every act is confined to one subject. Now let me elaborate this. Such as if the legislature were to create an act about the conveyances upon the public streets and highways. Well, the General Assembly is delegated power to only a degree of regulation to private conveyances slash private automobiles upon the streets and highways. Whereas for commercial purposes, they have full legislative power over. That subject matter would be transportation. So obviously we need to go to the law library and look this up. That is one thing I haven't been able to do, which I will be doing. That is something very important. I'm going to elaborate on this a little bit further here in a moment. Next, Article 4, Legislative, Section 20 of the Indiana Republic Constitution of 1851. Every act and joint resolution shall be plainly worded, avoiding as far as practicable the use of technical terms. We are definitely going to be elaborating on this one. According to Black's Law Dictionary, 6th edition, page 1463, technical means belonging or peculiar to an art or profession. Technical terms are frequently called in the books words of art, immaterial, not affecting substantial rights without substance. Of course, I have underlined there, and the key words to that definition is technical terms are frequently called in the books words of art. And to remind you, ladies and gentlemen, terms of art or words of art are deceptive words and terms used to manipulate the masses. And by the masses, I mean we the people. Let's define words, shall we? According to Black's Law Dictionary, 2nd edition, published year 1910, page 1231, words is defined as, as used in law, this word generally signifies the technical terms and phrases appropriate to particular instruments, or aptly fitted to the expression of a particular intention in legal instruments. Ooh, and it further defines words of art. Words of art is defined as, the vocabulary or terminology of a particular art or science, and especially those expressions which are idiomatic or peculiar to it. What it all boils down to is, nowadays, it is called legalese. The language spoken by those who create the law. And it's much different from the common tongue, and it's meant to be different. Legalese, according to Black's Law Dictionary, 8th edition, published here in 2004, page 2616, is defined as, the jargon characteristically used by lawyers, especially in legal documents. I also found the definition legalese from the Law Dictionary, and I have the source up on the screen. It is a website, thelawdictionary.org, and it defines legalese as a modern word that is used to describe the legal and technical language used to write laws, wills, and other legal documents. 
Now we got the definition of terms of art from West Encyclopedia of American Law, edition 2. It is the online version, and terms of art is defined as a word or phrase that has special meaning in a particular context. A term of art is a word or phrase that has a particular meaning. The classification of a word or phrase as a term of art can have legal consequences. Wow, they say it plain as day. They're transparent when it comes to that definition because that is very true. A word or phrase as a term of art has legal consequences. That is why it is so important that you properly defend yourself in court. You need to know exactly what to say and how to go about saying it. The legal system constantly and subversively construes the every use of language as being legal terms of art rather than the real common meaning and usage. The primary reason that there is any misunderstanding at all about this fact is because those professionally operating within the system are constantly telling the public that unless the law creates a specific definition for a given term or phrase, then they too are always using regular English words and sentences in their everyday common and ordinary meaning and context rather than legal terms and phrases of art having an entirely legal meaning and context. However, this is factually false. Whenever an attorney or judge makes the statement that they are construing a term or phrase in its common and ordinary meaning and context, they actually mean its common and ordinary meaning and context in relation to law, not common English or the common tongue. The General Assembly for the Indiana Republic do not abide by Article 4, Section 20 of the Indiana Republic Constitution of 1851, because technical terms, otherwise known as terms of art or words of art, are being used by some authorities of the state of Indiana knowingly and intentionally to deceive the public at large. This section of the Indiana Republic Constitution of 1851 should also be directed to the Indiana Statute Revision Commission and whoever else has been delegated power to the codification and revisions of the Indiana Code, since its contents are the codification of all laws currently in effect within Indiana, including the acts, bills, and joint resolutions from the legislature, especially from them. But there are discrepancies with the bills passed by the legislature and the interpretation conducted by the agencies and committees. The code does not have the legislative title clause that the Constitution requires the bills from the legislature to have. The statutes do not have the language that the Constitution requires the bills from the legislature to have. Hence, the statutes are not the actual law. They are agency and revision committee interpretations of what is actually in the bills from the legislature, which is the actual law. When codifying the acts or bills, the agencies and committees must express the will and intent of the legislature with clear and ambiguous wording and terminology to not confuse or deceive the public. This document, which is the constitutionally protected and secured right to locomotion and personal liberty, the right to travel in a private conveyance slash private automobile, reveals the words of art or legalese used in the legal profession such as a motor vehicle, a license, a citizen, a resident, a driver, etc. And that is why I have based this mini-series, Learning the Law, off of this document. This document was beautifully produced. It took many years to make. And as you can see, it discusses in detail quite a bit stuff that is very important. And I'm not the only one that's talking about this. Y'all need to go check out Eddie Craig the rule of law website of his. He speaks of this and many other facets of the law as well. Next we have Article 4, the Legislative, Section 23 of the Indiana Republic Constitution of 1851. In all the cases enumerated in the preceding section and in all other cases where a general law can be made applicable, all laws shall be general and of uniform operation throughout the state. And underneath this we have a court case to provide some clarity for it. This is Warren versus Indiana Telephone Company. This was the Supreme Court of the Indiana Republic in 1940. In quote, the Constitution of Indiana provides that the powers of the government are divided into three separate departments, the legislative, the executive, including the administrative, and the judicial. And no person charged with official duties under one of these departments shall exercise any of the functions of another, except as in this Constitution expressly provided. The judicial power of the state shall be vested in a Supreme Court, and circuit courts and such other courts as the General Assembly may establish. The Supreme Court shall have jurisdiction, coextensive with the limits of the state, in appeals and writs of error, under such regulations and restrictions as may be prescribed by law. It shall also have such original jurisdiction as the General Assembly may confer. 
All courts shall be opened, and every man for injury done to him in his person, property, or reputation shall have remedy by due course of law. Justice shall be administered freely and without purchase, completely and without denial, speedily and without delay. And in all civil cases, the right of the trial by jury shall remain inviolate. These provisions of the Constitution are a part of the fundamental law of the state, declared by the people themselves acting in their sovereign capacity. As such, they are entitled to strict construction. It has been said that the language of each provision of the Constitution is to be considered as though every word had been hammered into place. Under the Constitution, the right to a jury trial must remain inviolate in civil cases. This guarantee is self-executing and will be enforced independent of statutory enactment. It is to be noted that the jurisdiction of this court in appeals and writs of error is absolute which is quite different than if the Constitution had provided that such jurisdiction should be exercised in such cases as the legislature might direct. The only power of the General Assembly over such jurisdiction is to regulate and restrict it. The words regulate and restrict, as used in the Constitution, have long had a clear and definite meaning. They do not imply the right to prohibit or forbid. While the legislature may regulate and restrict the Supreme Court as to how it may take jurisdiction, it cannot take away from the court the jurisdiction over this particular subject, granted by the Constitution, and bestow it upon any other tribunal, and a legislative enactment which seeks to do so in contrary to the Constitution. The legislature has the undoubted right to regulate appeals, but the power to regulate does not give authority to take away, or bestow it upon another tribunal. The only ground upon which the creation of the appellate court can be constitutionally justified is, that jurisdiction may be conferred upon it to determine such cases as the legislature may designate, subject to the constitutional power vested in the Supreme Court to review its action, either upon writs of error or seriori, as an inherent power under the Constitution which even the legislature cannot take away. Substantive rules of law of the most important consequences to litigants may be directly or indirectly involved in the exercise of original jurisdiction of the appellate court in reviewing compensation cases. Uniformity in the interpretation and application of the law is the keystone of our system of jurisprudence. Special privileges are abhorred, and laws of a local or class nature prohibited in so far as possible. These principles are emphasized and reiterated in our state constitution. We have already quoted the provisions that all courts shall be open, and every man for injury done to him in his person, property, or reputation shall have remedy by due course of law. Justice shall be administered freely and without purchase, completely and without denial, speedily and without delay. And the Supreme Court shall have jurisdiction coextensive with the limits of the state and appeals and writs of error under such regulations and restrictions as may be prescribed by law. The Constitution also provides that the General Assembly shall not grant to any citizen or class of citizens privileges or immunities which, upon the same terms, shall not equally belong to all citizens that in all cases where a general law can be made applicable, all laws shall be general and of uniform operation throughout the state, that the General Assembly shall not pass local or special laws in any of the following enumerated cases, that is to say, 3. Regulating the practice in courts of justice, that the General Assembly shall provide that justice shall be administered in a uniform mode of pleading, that the Supreme Court shall, upon the decision of every case, give a statement in writing of each question arising in the record of such case and of the decision of the court thereon, and that the General Assembly shall provide by law for the speedy publication of the decisions of the Supreme Court made under this Constitution. These quotations are enough to indicate beyond doubt that it was the positive intention of the framers of our Constitution that the laws of this state should be general and uniform so far as it is possible to make them so. Such uniformity cannot be attained or preserved if the courts that interpret and apply the laws are not required to take their controlling precedents from some common source. If other courts than this court are to be permitted to construe statutes and state rules of substantive law without recourse being provided for review by this court, the result will be as destructive to uniformity as the legislature was permitted to enact local and special laws for every county in the state. But it does not necessarily follow that the litigant would be left without a remedy. Where a self-executing constitutional right is violated, no statutory remedy is necessary for its protection. Under such circumstances, it would become the duty of this court to supply the procedure. 
It is not the policy of the law to require unnecessary things to be done, and no writ of sidorari or other formal proceedings are required to enable this court to gain access to such records. When a proper showing is made in, and as a part of the petition to transfer that the appellate court has failed to consider and pass upon a substantial question duly presented to it, this court will examine the record, papers, and briefs in the same manner, and to the same extent as if these had been brought up by a writ of error. By this means, the right of litigants to have their appeals fully and finally considered by the court of last resort will be amply protected. This leads to a consideration of what is the province of a court when a review of an administrative order is sought. It must be conceded that it is the undoubted function of the court to determine the matter of jurisdiction, that is, the power of the administrative agency to decide the question which it has undertaken to decide. Jurisdiction is grounded upon constitutional or statutory authority, the existence of which is always a judicial question. All of the powers of the judiciary with respect to the review of administrative orders may be said to be embraced in the duty to determine if the requirements of due process have been met. The constitutional guarantee of due process is one of broad and comprehensive implications, not readily definable with precision. Among its elements are reasonable notice, an opportunity for a fair hearing, and the right to have a court of competent jurisdiction determine if the findings is supported by evidence. In ascertaining whether the finding of the administrative agency meets the requirement of due process, the court will look to the substance rather than the form. Well said. Next is Article 4, the Legislative, Section 27 of the Indiana Republic Constitution of 1851. Every statute shall be a public law unless otherwise declared in the statute itself. Let's go ahead and define public law. According to Black's Law Dictionary, 6th edition, page 1230, public law is defined as a general classification of law, consisting generally of constitutional, administrative, criminal, and international law, concerned with the organization of the state, the relations between the state and the people who compose it, the responsibilities of public officers to the state, to each other, and to private persons, and the relation of states to one another. An act which relates to the public as a whole. It may be 1. General, applying to all persons within the jurisdiction, 2 local, applying to a geographical area, or three, special, relating to an organization which is charged with the public interest. That portion of law that defines rights and duties with either the operation of government or the relationships between the government and individuals, associations, and corporations. In another sense, a law or statute that applies to the people generally of the nation or state adopting or enacting it is denominated a public law, as condo distinguished from a private law, affecting only an individual or a small number of persons. So that's what the Constitution means when it says every statute shall be a public law. The next few pages in this document consist of Article 5, which is dealing with the executive branch, and it is section 12 through 17, all from the Indiana Republic Constitution of 1851. And it deals with the governor, his powers, what he's able to do, uh, vetoing, making, uh, passing each bill, and whatnot. The next section we will cover is Article 6, the administrative branch. And we have a few things to go over in that section. Alright, ladies and gentlemen, that ends part one of episode four of Learning the Law. Please stay tuned. we got a lot more information coming to you. We're here to teach you what you need to know so you and your family can seek prosperity when it comes to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And as always, you can count on the Defenders of Rights to teach you how to defend your rights.